Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome to a new video. This video will be about the brand new Core i9 9900KS. And KS or the S behind the K seems to be like special edition because if you take a look at the packaging of the 9900KS it looks very similar to the 9900K only that special edition is written underneath and if you're wondering what's, what's the difference between the 9900K and KS basically 9900KS has all core turbo frequency of 5 GHz across all cores and that's the difference, that's everything so you could just simulate your 9900KS by using a 9900K and push it to 5 GHz maybe you already own one that is clocked to 5 GHz so you will have exactly the same performance. There is literally no difference. The only thing that I find personally interesting is if Intel is delivering a CPU like that, guaranteed um, 5 GHz across all cores on Turbo, it means that the quality of the CPU has to be better, so it's a better bin than the previous 9900K. That's why from my personal perspective the only thing that's kind of interesting of the CPU or could be interesting is overclocking potential. That's why we will also use some dry ice today, do some dry ice testing with this CPU, see if we can squeeze out some additional megahertz of this chip. First of all, let's talk about power consumption of 9900KS versus, for example, 3900X. If you're wondering about this whole power consumption TDP topic, please go and watch the previous video of Gamers Nexus where he did a deep dive into what the TDP value really means. Because a 3900X with a rated TDP of 105 watt can consume easily like 130, 140 watt under full load. The same goes for the 9900KS. Uh, with 127 watt TDP, the CPU, especially in turbo mode, consumes a lot more because the TDP of 127 watt is rated at the base frequency, but not at the turbo. At turbo it consumes more. So let's take a look at Windows. I will just show you how this works in reality. Let's do a quick run of Cinebench R20, mainly because it takes quite a long time. Because if you take a look at the frequency right now, we are at 5 gigahertz across all cores. Then we have uh, the core temperature typically around 75 to 80 degrees Celsius with the Corsair H115i. And the package power consumption is currently about 190 to 195 watt peak. And now it drops down to 127, which is the TDP. And that's because of the Turbo Boost time window. That's a value you can also configure in BIOS. If you set that limit to unlimited, that's basically what multi-core enhancement is doing or MCE. So this means the 9900KS can only run the 5 GHz Turbo Boost for a certain amount of time. I think it's about 16 seconds, maybe 17 seconds. And after that, it will drop down to maximum 127 watt power consumption. Therefore, it cannot sustain the boost clock of 5 GHz and it will be more about yeah, 4.5, 4.6 GHz during very high load like in Cinebench R15. What does this mean for gaming? I tested different gaming applications to see how the boost frequency behaves during gaming benchmarks. And for CSGO, CPU consumed maximum of 98 watt, so that's uh, 5 gigahertz all the time with 1080p. Shadow of the Tomb Raider with 1080p, con CPU consumed maximum 126 watt, so in this, in this case also the 5 gigahertz was always there. With Shadow of the Tomb Raider with 1440p, the load is shifted even more towards the GPU, therefore the maximum power consumption of the CPU dropped down a little more to 117. Also in this case 5 GHz turbo was always there. For example in times by extreme you have GT1 and GT2. GT1 so the graphics test 1 and the graphics test 2. In those two benchmarks 5 GHz on the CPU was always present but going to the physics test CPU dropped, uh, dropped down to like 4.5 to 5 GHz depends on the exact state of the benchmark. Let's get to some benchmarks before we start with overclocking. Cinebench R20 first. First of all, Cinebench R20 is fluctuating quite a lot, so I'm not so much a fan of this benchmark for comparison, but just keep this in mind. Okay, on top we have the 3900X obviously with four additional cores. It's much ahead of the 9900K or 9900KS. Multi 7120 points. 9900KS stock has only 4500 points. If you enable multi-core enhancement then it's 4607 points. It's not much of an improvement there mainly because if you 
enable multi-core enhancement, then I saw that the ABX offset is set to 2, while without multi-core enhancement, the ABX offset on the CPU is set to 0. That's why if you enable multi-core enhancement, the CPU will actually clock a little bit lower than 5 GHz, so most of the cases uh, 4.8 GHz, because Cinebench R20 is using ABX. That's why multi-core enhancement doesn't help in this benchmark as much. 9900KS at 5.2 GHz OC has a very strong single core benchmark score of 513, while 3900X is 499, which is basically identical to 9900KS in this case, with 498 and 497. A quick look at Adobe Premiere, obviously a high core count CPU is much better for such render applications. That's why 3900X or even in future 3950X will be much better in this case than a 9900K or 9900KS. The 9900KS is about one minute faster than the K in Adobe Premiere, going from 16 to about 15 minutes. With heavy OC of 5.2 gigahertz, it's going to 14 and a half minutes. Still, we are far away from the 3900X in this case. Let's talk about some gaming benchmarks. All the benchmarks are done in 1440p. I don't see why you should test 1080p or 720p with a CPU of this value, which you would obviously pair with a 2080 or 2080 Ti. And in this configuration, you should not play any games at 720p. That's why I don't see a reason testing this. First benchmark, Battlefield 5. Obviously the 9900K was already a little bit ahead of the 3900X in this case and the 9900KS especially with overclocking takes the lead in this chart. Shadow of the Tomb Raider 1440p looks kind of similar with the only difference that the 3900X was ahead of the 9900K in my testing but then the 9900KS was faster than the 3900X and with a little bit of overclocking the 9900KS also takes the lead here. Far Cry 5 1440p similar results 3900X a little bit slower than the 9900KS again a little bit faster and obviously with overclocking you gain another 4 to 5 FPS. So nothing surprising everything as expected as previously as all the other reviews we've, we've seen before 3900X versus 9900K there is in most gaming applications not much of a dif difference especially if you're playing in uh, high resolutions I mean if you're going even higher than 4040p you will probably see no difference at all 9900KS obviously is then still a little bit faster so overall you can say the 9900KS is the fastest CPU for gaming pretty much as the 9900K was before but keeping in mind that you get a higher core count with the 3900X and you can also use it for render applications. You just have to evaluate yourself what you're going to use the CPU for. Before we get to dry ice overclocking using this baby right here, it's a liquid nitrogen or dry ice cooler I developed a while ago, we are going to talk about overclocking numbers using this 280 millimeter AIO from Corsair, the H115i I'm currently using. You can see right now on my screen the CPU is pushed to 5.3 GHz across all cores using 1.3 volt. This is Cinebench R15 stable. You can hear that my fan curve is quite aggressive right now because you really need the cooling. We're hitting about 90 degrees Celsius peak on the CPU cores which is still fine. I can tell you that my CPU can do uh, 5.2 GHz across all cores with 1.35 volt rock stable like everything like uh, prime 95 all games rendering everything so that's what you can probably expect from the 9900ks uh, overall the cpu seems to be higher quality than the 9900k which was obvious that's also what we expected i think in general general we can expect about 300 yeah 200 to 300 megahertz more in average out of the KS than of the K. So overclocking wise, I think it's a quite interesting CPU. First of all, I have to check if this cooler fits onto the CPU because this one was originally made for Threadripper and also for Socket 2066 but seems to fit 
nicely on there at least without mounting gear we will not use any threaded rods and stuff for additional mounting pressure we'll just put the cooler on top of the cpu obviously thermal paste in between for better heat transfer and then use some paper towel just close off some of the gaps around the socket i'm not going to insulate it today with like vaseline and stuff it's too messy i don't want to spend uh, too much time on this um, i just want to see how the overclocking behaves so we will just use some paper towel around to catch some condensation. Using some Thermal Grizzly Cryonaut Extreme, it's a thermal paste that's not out yet. It's not yet on the market, but that's the stuff I use for XOC at the moment. Application. Verge, Verge completely approves. Fixing a temperature probe inside the container quickly. The hole here is filled with thermal paste. Sticking it here should be good. Added some additional paper on the right here to fix the container in the middle. It doesn't move away. I think this will work. Everything is set up, should be ready to go. We have a second camera right here, which I think will make it better and easier for you to watch. I have the CPU cooler in the middle. We have a thermometer right here with a dual channel. So one temperature is ambient temperature, one temperature is the temperature of the CPU container right here. Then we also have a current clamp here that is showing and measuring the current flowing across the 8-pin EPS connector to the CPU, basically monitoring the CPU power consumption. In today's video we will use dry ice with 3mm pellets. They are very convenient to use, much better than the bigger pellets I used previously. Alright, this is our base condition for now. CPU cooler about 22 degrees Celsius on the cooler bottom, measured right here. Then we have the CPU clocked to 5.4 GHz across all cores with 1.4 V core in idle which should result in 1.35, 1.36 under load. This should not be stable under this condition. We will just perform a run quickly and see, yeah. Crashed immediately. We saw a quick peak temperature of 86 to 90 degrees Celsius. We will now test the frequency scaling of the CPU when it comes to cold to see how much lower we have to go in temperature to get the last additional 100 megahertz. To see if that would be kind of possible with custom water cooling. Obviously you cannot compare the custom water cooling with the temperature you can see on my cooling device right here. We have to go by the core temperature. CPU cooler temperature is much lower now. We are at about 0 degrees Celsius. I just already passed it in the German video. Running 5.4 gigahertz, you can see runs perfectly fine now with 1.4 v-core in idle resulting in about 1.36 v-core under load peak temperature under load right now 65 to 70 degree celsius and this was necessary to get 5.4 gigahertz to pass Silverbench. so we need about 15 to 20 degrees celsius per 100 megahertz on the 9900ks it's a very similar scaling to the 9900k Yeah, we're now at minus 65 degrees Celsius, a little bit of acetone and dry ice, that's really doing the thing. 
What was really interesting, I just tried it for the German video, is I adjusted the CPU to 5.6 GHz using still 1.4 V core because previously the 9900K would extremely well scale with temperature. I could just overclock the CPU previously to 5.6, 5.7 and 9900K just by lowering the voltage, but I just tried it in the German video, it immediately crashed. Let's just see what happens now. Yeah, okay, now it seems to work. Maybe I needed a little bit lower temps or it was just a random crash. Looks like it was just a random crash. Okay, 5.6. Seems to run fine. What's interesting always is how much the CPU power consumption is lowered, even though the clock is higher. We just saw 170, 180 degree, uh, 170, 180 watt peak. Considering that we increase the frequency to what we did on, for example, water cooling. Yeah, the power consumption really decreased. That's always cool to see by the temperature. We reached the limit right now of the voltage. We are still running the same voltage as with the previous testing. So that's 1.4 in idle, 1.35 under load, resulting in 5.8 gigahertz running right now, Cinebench R15 stable. Compared to previously with a Corsair AIO, we were able to run 5.3. By lowering the temperature by 100 Kelvin roughly, we increased the frequency by 500 megahertz. That means we need about 20 degrees Celsius or 20 Kelvin per 100 megahertz increase. That's just a good indicator for you. Let's say you have your CPU rock stable at 5.2 with a peak temperature of 80 degrees Celsius. If you manage to get your CPU temperature down to 60 degrees Celsius max, then you can probably squeeze another 100 megahertz out of your CPU. That's the conclusion I want to give you with this testing. I'm getting closer to the limit of the dry ice right now running 6 gigahertz on all cores 1.49 volt right now i tried it before with 1.53 1.52 but then the cpu was getting too warm we are hitting a power consumption of 220 watt right now i had 230 before in this condition the cpu was getting too warm therefore it crashed mid run but this seems to be stable that's cool so about 6 gigahertz maybe 6.1 is probably what we can get with this cpu out of cinebench r15 Yeah. Last kind of interesting step to me is what can we validate with this CPU? I increased CPU voltage to 1.6 volt right now. And we will just see how high can we get the CPU without any kind of benchmark, just validation. It's pretty funny how easy XOC is these days. I didn't touch anything besides uh, just doing power limit and uh, load line calibration, CPU V core, and that's it. Like those mainboards are so much optimized these days that you don't really have to do anything. You just put your cooler on there, at least for basic XOC. Obviously, if you go for hardcore on the limit LN2 overclocking, it's a different story because then you come to boot issues and all of this stuff. But um, just yeah, 6.3 gigahertz across all cores was not really an issue. I thought it would just be cool to test if we can actually game at those frequencies. That's why I pushed the CPU to 5.8, which was previously Cinebench stable. Now in the PUBG lobby, running 200 FPS right now. Average is showing 217, 1% low. It's actually quite low <laughs> with uh, 93, but let's see how it goes. Yeah, I failed quite early because I don't have sound on this setup right now, but it, it really works. At 5.8 GHz, you can technically game even with XOC. The question is always how long is this going to be stable? Because at a certain point, we will have condensation on this rig. And once we have condensation on the backside of the CPU or anywhere ne near their memory slots, it will be a problem. Things will become unstable, but for the moment, Works fine, 5.8 gigahertz on the CPU, averaging about yeah, 200 FPS. And one more annoying thing is that obviously you always have to get dry ice every few minutes and then have to fill up your container. Also ventilation in your room has to be decent, otherwise you will have a lot of uh, CO2 in the air, which can technically be a problem at a certain point. So much for now about the 9900KS. The CPU is really only interesting for gaming. For gaming, it's the fastest CPU on the market. Still, you have to decide yourself if you might have other applications that need more cores, then you maybe should still go for the 3900X. It's up to you to decide which CPU you want to get. 
but the CPU compared to the 9900K obviously is better, will overclock higher, um, has a much better quality. So on average, I would say 300 megahertz more is what you can expect from those chips. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time.